Born in the Sudan, her family moved to London when she was two years old. Zainab studied philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford University and took a master's degree on Middle East history and anthropology at SOAS London University. She is the current chair of the Royal African Society, vice president of the United Nations Association UK and a board member of the African Union Foundation. She is also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council. Current work, Hard Talk for the BBC. Zainab also presents Global Cautions and World Debates on BBC World TV. Through her own productions company, Kush Communication, she has produced and presented many programs, including currently the Definitive TV series of African History in partnership with UNESCO. I invited Zainab Badawi to talk about her work, her beliefs, and her commitment to making the journal History of Africa, what she calls UNESCO's best kept secret, accessible to the public at large. Thank you very much. Zainab, let me take you back. Um, how do you start your career in journalism? Your father was a very famous Sudanese editor. That's true. My father was a, a journalist and writer in Sudan before he came to the United Kingdom, where he worked for many, many years for the BBC Arabic service. Yes. But you know, when I was growing up until the age of 16, I always wanted to be a doctor. Yeah, I never wanted to go into broadcasting or journalism. Um, but then I found when I was 16, I couldn't stand the sight of blood. So I thought, hmm. Bango is my ambition to becoming a doctor, so I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I've always been very interested in current affairs, politics, people. So I suppose at the back of my mind somewhere, my late father's influence must have been there. And yes, I went into the media. Some of your current work, just to mention uh, a few of them, BBC Hard Talk, Global Cautions, World Debate on BBC, World TV. Your work is time consuming. How do you balance work and family? It is actually a big, huge balancing act, juggling act. You juggle all these balls in the air like a circus performer and you hope one of them doesn't drop. Um, so far, touch wood, um, I haven't had any disasters. Um, I'm quite organised. I'm also quite good at compartmentalising you know, my life. So when I am doing my work, I'm very focused on that. And then when I'm with my family, I'm very focused on that. I've got four children yes. and um, two sons and two daughters. And um, it, it is difficult, actually, but um, I enjoy it. I mean, sometimes I wish I didn't live life at 100 miles an hour all the time and that I could slow down a little bit. But um, that's the way I am. I've always enjoyed working. You have your own production company, Kush Communication. Why Kush Communications? I was born in northern Sudan. My family are from um, the north of Sudan, beyond Khartoum, going towards the border with Egypt. And that in ancient times was known as the Kingdom of Kush, K-U-S-H. So when I started my production company and I was thinking of a name, at first I called it Zainab Badawi Limited. And then I thought, hmm, that's a bit dull. So I then changed to Kush Communications and um, that's how it got its name because I love history and obviously um, I identify with the Kingdom of Kush, so hence the name. Zainab, you have been in media for the last 25 years. In one of your interviews, you said that this project, the General History of Africa, is by the far most exciting, the most interesting and the most valuable projects you have ever been involved in. Can you please share your experience and tell us why is it different? So the General History of Africa is the name of this project that UNESCO started a few decades ago, charting the course of African history from prehistory to the modern era. And I'm making a series of television programmes called The History of Africa with Zainab Badawi, which bases its facts um, and derives its facts from this, these volumes compiled by UNESCO, written by African scholars. Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe. People have been living here in Africa longer than anywhere else in the world. Yet so often, their history has been completely overlooked or written by outsiders. Join me for a groundbreaking TV series, The History of Africa, told by Africans themselves.
big project. And I said it's the most important thing I've done because I've worked all my life in news and current affairs. And you know, these change all the time. You know, things get out of date. I use that word ephemeral, they're short lived. And what I like about the history series is it, it will last for ages. You know, I've made these, these programmes and you can watch them in 10 years time and they would still be relevant. So I think that's what I like about them, the fact that they um, will stand the test of time. But I also like them, I like the project because um, it, it is a pan-African project and I'm a pan-Africanist. You know, I was born in the Sudan and my father was involved in the struggle for independence against the British colonial powers. So I've always, you know, looked at Africa as one big continent, north, south, east, west. And this was at its heart a pan-African project. So I like it for that reason too. I also like it because I think that um, Africans have had their history either denigrated, written by outsiders, or they've been told they don't have any. Uh, the access we've had has been terrific, including your own country, Eritrea. It was difficult not because it was um, arduous or it was, um, you know, we, we, we came across obstacles or anything like that. It was just difficult because, you know, these are large countries, in many cases, Algeria, Sudan, and we weren't just going to capital cities, we were going off the beaten track to historic sites which were in the middle of nowhere. And so, logistically, it was a big, big challenge. But I have a wonderful production team and, um, you know, we managed to, to do it and we didn't really have any disasters. Also, we used local crews wherever we went and that was a huge bonus because they had local knowledge and um, therefore that accelerated the process for us. You know, at the beginning when I was thinking about this, people said to me, oh, you want cons consistency, you want to take a cameraman from the UK who you know and a sound guy so that you know what to expect and, um, and, and you know, you'll have that continuity. But I decided that it would be better to every country I go to, to use a local crew. So in Tanzania, a Tanzanian crew, in Eritrea, an Eritrean crew, in Sudan, a Sudanese crew. Um, and it has really paid dividends. First of all, they are some of the best cameramen and sound technicians I have ever worked with. I will be traveling across the continent, north, south, east and west, bringing you a history of the African people, starting from the beginning of humankind, through Africa's great early civilizations, to the arrival of the major religions and their impact on the continent. Mostly young men, extremely technically savvy, and also it brought benefits because when I was filming um, local people, they wouldn't feel reticent because it was a local cameraman speaking in their own local language saying, I'm just going to take film you for a little while. So they were at ease. It also meant that um, the local cameraman knew the light in their country, when the light was going to be favourable, when I should rush to make sure that we got our shots before sunset. They'd often visited some of the sites, so they'd already, they could act as my eyes and ears and say, um, oh, actually, there's a better location on the site than this. So it really, really was the right thing to do. And I have to say, Yara, that at the end of every shoot, the camera crew would say to me, even though they'd worked really hard, sometimes 12 hour days, they'd take me by the arms and they'd say, Zainab, thank you for letting us do this project with you. We have learned about our country. We have seen aspects of our country sometimes that we didn't even know existed. And they listened to their own national academics talking about their own history and they learned. And that for me was just, you know, a huge bonus. Your visit to Eritrea was part of the general history of Africa. You visit places such as Dalek Islands on the Red Sea. You filmed in Kuhaito as part of the prehistoric finds, Asmara Art Deco, Masawa Old City. What gets you interested most during your stay in Eritrea? I have to say, you know, Eritrea has always had this very enigmatic um, you know, reputation. Very few outsiders are allowed to go in. I was very delighted that the Eritrean Embassy in London and also the authorities, the Ministry of Information and Culture in Asmara, uh, granted me permission to go into the country to film. And I have to say that, you know, really I was totally surprised by the 
extent of the um, historic sites in the country. Um, I was also um, really captivated by the beautiful Red Sea coast. It must be one of the most unspoilt stretches of coastal area that you'd want to see anywhere in the world. Absolutely stunning. And um, the people were so friendly, they couldn't do enough for me. You know, um, I was really completely, um, you know, taken up, but taken by, by the country and, and its history. It exactly. was really wonderful. Did you visit Dalek Islands? I went to the Dahlak Islands. Dalek yeah, Islands. The, yeah, the Dahlak Islands. We went to um, Masawa, the port of Masawa, and then we took the boat to the Dahlak Islands, an archipelago of islands, very little visited. There are about a couple of hundred, I think, but only one really. Uh, Dahlak Islands, the big one, is, is um, inhabited. And um, that was really quite extraordinary to get there. Um, it was used in the 7th century by um, some Arabs and Muslims who'd arrived because, of course, Eritrea is so near the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian coast of Yemen today. And so it was obviously an area where the Arabs came. So um, it was anthropologically, culturally, linguistically very interesting for me to see the people of the Dahlak Islands. Um, I spoke to them in Arabic, obviously having been born in Khartoum, I can speak Arabic, it's my family language. Um, and there was a man I interviewed there who was still very proud of his quasi-Arab heritage. Um, so I think that the Dahlak Islands was really fascinating because it showed the melting pot um, that has existed in Eritrea over the centuries because of its location, very strategic location on the Red Sea, which made it so significant in ancient times. I'm very excited. So when is this feeling coming now to prehistoric? The first one will be shown on BBC World right at the be very beginning of July. And the programme on uh, that includes the footage from Eritrea will appear, I think, uh, at the end of July, early August, this around year. there. Yes, so that's when you'll see that on BBC World. But I am making these films available free of charge to all African state TV stations, including Eritrean TV. Um, you know, Zainab, you visit the capital city, Asmara. Do you think that Eritrea has it, what it makes to make the list on UNESCO World Heritage? Absolutely. I mean, again, I was absolutely um, staggered to see how beautiful Asmara was, because, of course, it was built at the time of the colonial era and by the Italians, and so it um, owes a lot of its architecture to uh, that Italianate style um, from, you know, architects from Italy, but and obviously built by locals and using some local materials. So it would be wrong to say that these were Italian buildings. They're not, obviously, they're in Asmara and they're Eritrean. Um, but I think that the designs, the architecture, um, the Italian architects who did design the buildings were more innovative and experimented a bit more than they do in their own native country. And I think Asmara has really reaped the benefits of that. And so you see these gorgeous art deco buildings like the post office, both on the outside and on the inside, absolutely stunning buildings. I mean, they, they rightly would deserve, in my opinion, UNESCO World Heritage Site. In 2011, you moderate a leaders forum at uh, UNESCO, and on this occasion, you said that girls' education was your family business. Can you please explain? I do say education for women is the family business because my great grandfather yes. um, was the pioneer of female education in the Sudan. So at the turn of the last century, there were no schools for girls in Sudan, and my great grandfather, Sheikh Babikir Badri, decided that you know, why shouldn't he have his girls educated alongside his sons? So he set up in his own house, in the courtyard, a girls' school, and he set the example of having his own daughters educated. He had a lot of children, hence a lot of daughters. We say in the family he was so pro-women, he married four of them. But yeah, so he had a lot of children. But anyway, putting that to one side, I grew up with, you know, grandmothers and great aunts who could read and write, who if they were alive today, they'd be well over a hundred. And um, he set up schools and now the family also have a university for women in the capital called al Ahfad, which means the descendants, which one of my relatives, my uncle, runs to this day. So, um, yes, he, he started education for girls and, you know, I grew up with, even now in my family, we, you know, all the women are highly educated. I, I have 
great aunts in their 70s with postgraduate degrees from Western universities. When was the last time you went to Sudan? Oh, I was there last year. Last year. Mm. So you are I go always. quite regularly. And when is your next trip to Eritrea? Well, I'd like to go very soon, sometime this year, if I could um, arrange that. I'll talk to you after this interview, Yarod. <laughs> Zainab Badawi, thank you for being with us on Air I, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk to you. Thank you, Yarod.